Okay, it looks like uh, everybody is in that needs to be in. Uh, good day, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us for our webinar today. We're really excited to be presenting and co-presenting with our friends from the Arlington Restaurant Initiative, BizLaunch, all of our Arlington County partners that are here on the call, as well as our friends from the state, Virginia ABC, to join today to talk about reopening safely uh, during the era of COVID-19. We're really glad that you're here with us today on the broadcast because we find that it's very important for us as a community and our business community and, and is in such a, a position to be able to help others as we get through this health crisis. And so we work very closely with our friends and our partners to come up with the most important facts that you need to know as you open up your business tomorrow during phase one. I have on the line with me my colleague, Lourdes Morales, who is also going to be uh, interacting with friends that are here on the webinar. Uh, just so you know, we're gonna have a formal presentation and then at the end, we're going to try to get to as many questions that you have that are remaining after you've heard from all of our subject matter experts. Lourdes, if you could say a few words to our Spanish speaking uh, business owners, that would be great. Thank you, Tara, and good morning, everyone. Happy to be here. Eh, buenos días para todas las personas que hablan español. Por favor, noten que van a poder hacer sus preguntas en español. A la derecha tienen una ventana en donde pueden escribir sus preguntas y al final de la presentación vamos a tener un espacio para preguntas y respuestas y yo con mucho gusto las voy a traducir. Eh, también vamos a tener la guía en español que se las estaremos haciendo llegar a todas las personas que están suscritas a nuestra comunicación, pero si en caso aún no se han suscrito, por favor, mándenme un email a lmorales.arlingtonpa.us. Bienvenidos. Gracias por estar aquí. Thanks, Tara. Thank you, Lourdes. And so let's go onward together. Here we go. Uh, we're in a new normal. Uh, the, what was six months ago is not the same. Uh, we've all had to pivot the way that we're doing business. And I love this quote here that you see below on the slide. The strength of a company lies in its ability to continuously evolve. There's no stronger statement than the moment uh, of Mark Wardell's words. Uh, we wanted to come together as part of Arlington County to present to our business communities ways to evolve their businesses during this health crisis. We wanna make sure that you hear from us directly and our subject matter experts what the expectations are as we enter into phase one. Most of the information that you're gonna hear about today was gathered from our Forward Virginia initiative from the Commonwealth of Virginia and the executive orders that the government governor has mandated. And what we've done is we've taken that information and we've looked at the best practices, the guidelines, and we're really trying to adhere to those so that not only is our business community safe, business owners, staff, workers, your clients, your customers. We wanna make sure that as we enter into this next phase of this health pandemic safely for everyone and as a community. And I just wanna to, to pause as well to say, I am honored to be a participant in our small business community. It is, I haven't lived anywhere else or been part of a community in where people really care about one another. And the reason that you're on this webinar today is to make sure that you get all the facts so that you can continue to make our community as strong as it is. And so I, I really wanted to just say thank you for bearing with us during these unprecedented times. I know it's become cliche, but it is unprecedented. And we've all had to pivot and we've all had to evolve. And we wanna make sure that we do it so that we're making our most vulnerable people safe, that we make our healthy people safe. And so that's really where this labor of love of putting this webinar together with our friends in the police department, our friends in the health department, 
our planners, our, our fire department, ABC, we're all here to make sure that we do this safely for you. And I just, sometimes um, things happen so quickly and so fast, and I just wanted to take a pause in a moment to reiterate that fact. So looking at our agenda, what we wanna come out of today is a general overview of what the Forward Virginia Executive Order contains, what that means for a variety of different business sectors, and what people have to consciously be thinking about each and every day in order to keep your workplace safe, whether it's a commercial business, whether it is a, um, a restaurant, whether it's retail, whether you're doing fitness, the goal with all of this is for us to be safe together as we ease out in back into the community. Uh, we have our friends from public health, and in this particular instance in phase one, our public health friends will be doing the enforcement and making sure that everybody is abiding by the guidelines. We'll be talking to a team of professionals about temporary outdoor seating. Uh, FIRE will be talking about occupancy numbers and egress. ABC will be talking about the things that you can do if you have an alcohol permit in your business. And then our friends at the Arlington Restaurant Initiative are gonna be discussing the business resources. And so let's just jump right on in. It's a lot of information. Uh, how I'm going to start it out is I'm going to discuss general business guidelines. These are the things that all businesses must adhere to. And no matter what industry sector you're in, you want to make sure that you're following the general guidelines for all business sectors. I'm also going to provide on the next slide the link to this document. This document is great. It's called Safer at Home Phase 1 guideline for all business sectors. It's really the framework from the state as to what we have to adhere to for our business community. And it's what I've drawn on. I'm going to highlight some key points in the next slide, but know that I couldn't include everything. And so I really recommend that you go in here and, and take a look and familiarize yourself with the materials that are in this general business guideline. So I drummed it up. I actually put it together in three distinct bullet points as part of the what all businesses need to really be doing. And the most paramount one is physical distancing, making sure that your company's culture devises best practices when it comes to physical distancing. So if you must go into your office or you're going into your brick and mortar, make sure that you are adhering to guidelines as to distancing, six foot distancing in many cases, 10 foot distancing if you're doing exercise, because what we know about the virus so far, and it's, it's, it's hard because how is it transmitted? And so is it surfaces? Is it in the air? So you wanna make sure that you take the physical distancing very seriously and you look at the square footage of the space that you have and you just rule out within six feet <laughs> the complete area. Having clear communication and signage to manage expectations for your customers, for your clients, for staff to say we're all in this together. If you're not feeling well, if you're running a fever, go home. Don't feel that you have to work. Encourage telework when possible so that if someone isn't well, they're at home and it's not being spread by coming out into the business. Limiting conferences and trade shows, places where a large number of people congregate. If you know in your workspace that there's a particular area um, the water cooler where everybody likes to go around. Make sure that you widen the space and use tape, measure. Um, you'll see a lot of different communities that are building circle areas where people can sit on outdoor lawns that are distanced and spaced. People are using water noodles and other things to make sure that the space and the physical distancing is done in a good way. The guideline also discuss a lot of information on enhanced cleaning and disinfection. 
This is really important and each industry sector will have specific guidelines that I'll get into about how often that you need to clean, the type of disinfection uh, products that you need to use. Most of them need to be provided by the uh, EPA. They need to be EPA approved disinfectant and you'll want to use CDC hygiene practices. This is not only for your business, it's for your customers, it's for everyone. If you take a look down below on the, the slide that I have here, it says safer at home phase one. What you'll find is not only the guidelines, but also the hyperlinks to what are EPA approved disinfectants? What does the CDC recommend today, May 28th, uh, that my uh, 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 employees and that I should be instituting? Some of the things that you should think about too is making sure that people have access to water, to soap, um, and make encouraging times and have people even put on their calendars or uh, an alarm that goes off on the phone that says time to wash hands. So that these are some common practices that you build into the culture of your business that you have to consciously think of, but then over time, it becomes a matter of habit to keep everyone safe. And then enhanced workplace safety. This is when you encourage people to test before they start work, to actually take a test, to stay sick if they, uh, if, to stay home if they are sick, and to adopt flexible sick leave policies. The key is is making sure that your commercial business, uh, your whether it's retail, whether it's brick and mortar, whether it's fitness, is the most safe environment that it can possibly be as people start to come out of the full stay at home and into phase one. Oops, sorry. Restaurant and beverages services, I'm gonna jump into that now. And you'll see a common theme in all of the slides as we move forward. You must adhere to all business guidelines. So that form that I talked about that was from the state, this is going to apply to each and every industry sector that I just mentioned. For restaurant and business services themselves though, occupancy may not exceed the 50% of the lowest occupancy load on your certificate of occupancy. So here's where it's really important uh, to look at your CO, what we call CO, and make sure that that lowest number of occupancy is being adhered to for your space. You also want to make sure that there are no more than 10 patrons seated as a party. So this is limiting the number of people that can be grouped or clustered together. Tables in restaurants and with use with beverage services must be positioned six feet apart from other tables. Buffets must be staffed by servers. Cannot have a buffet where there's no one in attendance. Bar seats and congregating areas of restaurants must be closed to patrons except as a through space. No self-service of food except beverages, including condiments. Employees working in customer facing areas must wear face coverings over their nose and mouth at all times. It does not necessarily have to be an N95 mask. We really wanna make sure that our first responders have those, but that there are cloth masks that, cloth masks that um, run the gamut for the CDC guidelines. A thorough cleaning and disinfection of frequently contacted services every 60 minutes. Sorry, I'm really trying to go ahead. I don't wanna go ahead. I wanna go back. Okay. Um, Tabletops, chairs, and credit card bills and folders must be cleaned in between patrons. And if any business cannot adhere to these requirements, it must close. And so this is the enforcement. This is what you wanna make sure that your business is doing to ensure that you can remain in operation as a restaurant and a beverage service. Brick and mortar retail businesses or any type of non-essential retail business, you must adhere to all of those business guidelines that are in the form from the state. Occupancy here must be limited to no more than 50% of the lowest occupancy load. Oh, every time I move this, I'm so sorry, everybody. Whoop, whoop. 
<laughs> Employees working in customer facing areas must wear face coverings over their nose and mouth at all times. And a business must adhere to these bulleted items and the guidelines. Fitness and exercise facilities, they may reopen for outdoor activities only. All indoor activities are prohibited. Must adhere to the business guidelines. Patrons, members, and guests must remain at least 10 feet apart during all activities. So it's a bit of a wider area because as you're working out, you might be using more of your breath and droplets and things of that nature. So it's a 10 feet uh, mandate versus six feet. Hot tubs, spas, splash pads, spray pools, and interactive play features must be closed. Outdoor swimming pools may be open for lap swimming only and must be limited to one person per lane. Employees working in customer facing areas may, may wear the face coverings. And I'm going to get a little bit later into some of the details with face coverings. Employers must ensure cleaning and disinfection of shared equipment after each use. Businesses must supply hand sanitizer stations or hand washing stations for patrons, members, and staff. All outdoor group activities may not have more than 10 guests, patrons, or members at any time. And if you do not adhere to these requirements, you must close. Personal care and personal grooming services. These are our beauty salons, barber shops, nail salons. They also must adhere to all business guidelines. Occupancy may not exceed 50% of the lowest occupancy load on the CO. Physical distancing must be done between workstations and only one appointment per service. Service providers and employees working in customer facing areas must wear face masks that cover the nose and mouth at all times. You must also provide face coverings for clients or ask that clients bring a face covering with them to wear during the service. And you wanna limit the types of services where the person or the client would need to take the face mask off. A thorough cleaning and disinfection of the frequently most contacted surfaces must be done at a minimum of, uh, I think, I believe 60 minutes per, um, I'm having problems, I'm going back, I'm going back, I'm going forward. Sorry, I need to go back to where I was. Um, and if any business does not adhere to these requirements, it must close. So moving forward, we're gonna talk about the face coverings because in each of the different industry sectors, it mentioned making sure that you have face coverings. And this is something that has been mandated from our friends at uh, the state. And so Arlington has actually come up with a program called We Are Covered. And it's our approach in making sure that when people are indoors, beginning tomorrow um, or tonight at midnight or into May 29th at midnight, you have to be covered. And so these are businesses, multifamily residences, any place where there's in-person activities. What we're going to do for businesses themselves, we don't have, it's going to be available on the hyperlink that you see below, but you will be able to get a placard that you can put in your establishment that says we are covered on your window. And so people know that uh, you are practicing safe health practices and that your business has reached out to us and that you are adhering to all of the guidelines. Unfortunately, um, it, the link will be ready uh, later today. It's actually being worked on now. So we're really excited to be able to work with people as part of this process. And these are the businesses which are required to have workers and consumers wear face coverings as they, they come. That's the personal care and grooming business, essential and non-essential brick and mortar, food and beverage es establishments, entertainment or public amusement establishments when they're permitted to open, where there are large gatherings of a lot of people. This includes transportation, uh, whether it's intrastate, interstate, or anywhere where there's congregating areas. When you go to state buildings, when you come to Arlington County, um, you will also be 
required to be covered. And any indoor space shared by groups of people who congregate within six feet of with, within each other or within close proximity of each other uh, for more than 10 minutes must also uh, make sure that they are covered as part of this campaign and initiative. And so with that, I'm going to send it over to my friend, very dear friend and colleague, Candace Wooden, who is with the um, Public Health Division and who will be doing a lot of the enforcement here. Uh, Candace. Good morning and thank you. Um, so the Public Health Division is responsible for licensing and inspecting all food establishments, hotels, motels, mobile food units, temporary events, water recreational facilities, um, and we also serve as a resource for vector complaints. Um, through this process, Public Health will be responsible for enforcing Executive Order 61 and the guidelines for all business sectors, um, including the recommendations for physical distancing, enhancing of cleaning and sanitization, and enforcing uh, workplace safety, such as monitoring your employees' um, health um, before their shift. Uh, we know that this is a difficult time for everyone, especially our businesses, um, but we must work together to keep our community safe. Now, a great thing that Candace has shared with us are some of these signs. Um, Candace, can you talk about some of these signs um, that are available to the business community? Absolutely. So the signs um, in the slide are required signs that must be posted on the doors at your establishments. You must have a sign um, that reminds empl uh, employees and customers of the public health um, reminders. So stay home if you're sick, monitor your temperature. If you're a high risk, um, over 65 with health conditions, then maybe you want to consider curbside pickup. Um, and then also the biggest thing from executive order 63 would be wearing face coverings. Um, these signs are available on the Arlington County webpage. We have a link for uh, COVID. It's Arlington County food establishment slash COVID. Um, you can get the sample signs there um, or you can get them from the Virginia Department of Health website. And there's tons of signs um, available to businesses on the Virginia Department of Health's business webpage. Um, the, second, the second one also talks about symptoms. So if you have any of the COVID-related symptoms um, in the prior 14 days, you may not enter the establishment. So we wanted to put these things into place mm -hmm. and provide you with these signs so that you don't have to do the work. So uh, it's, it's clear for the, for the patrons um, and feel free to use them. If you need them from us, if you need us to print them for you, we do not mind doing that. Just contact our main line and we will take care of that for you. And the second sign is a table tent sign that you can put on a table that is non-movable to instruct patrons to sit six feet apart. Now, Candace, if anyone has questions, um, is there a best practice for them to do about like either um, especially in making sure that they have access to the signage or if they need any information in different languages. Is there anything of that nature? They can email eHealth at Arlington VA here at US or you can call our main line at 703-228-7400 um, and you can actually speak to me. Everyone else does. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. You've been such a great supporter of our, our business community, so we really appreciate the information. And so now we're going to move into our temporary outdoor seating areas, and we have a lovely team that uh, is going to kick this off, and Jill Hunger uh, will be uh, kicking off the presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Tara. Uh just wanted to say I'm joined here with two of my colleagues, Chrissy Wellenfish with the Department of uh, Community Planning, Housing and Development, and Wei Huang with the Department of Environmental Services. I'm going to give a brief overview of our temporary outdoor seating areas, or what we're referring to as TOSAs, and they're going to get in a little bit more into the, the details of, of the application and implementation elements. 
So next slide. And next slide. Thank you. So really, why are we doing this? And we wanted to take an approach in creating temporary outdoor seating areas that remain focused on our key objective of considering potential regulatory flexibility for business activities that are affected by phase one. And in doing so, to provide safe environments, ensuring physical distancing, and to support Arlington's businesses. Next slide. So we recognize that these TOSAs can take several forms, seating areas in a surface parking lot, on public sidewalks and possibly public space, in a parklet, just a space or two on the curbside parking lane, provided that there are appropriate physical investments. And finally, while not technically TOSAs, existing rooftop dining areas that may serve customers during phase one, provided all applicable requirements are met. Slide. So we took an approach uh, in looking at this and realizing that there are a variety of, of, of these TOSAs, we wanted to, one, ensure that all are looked at in an administrative capacity. But we recognize that private property looks a little bit different than public property. Our public property and in our public rights of way there are a variety of different uses that need to be accommodated for in the public right of way, and we want to ensure that we have a balance. So the main difference is sort of when the approval happens and when the uh, written, excuse me, the written approval of the locality that's required for the Virginia ABCA TOSA license application occurs. The next slide. So I think the big thing is, what did the county do when it adopted its regulation? Well, the county board authorized the county manager to provide this administrative process uh, and to approve these TOSAs. We have established a basic application form and process um, with no charge. So these are free, uh, these applications and, and these permits are free. We developed some guidelines and standards for best practices. There will be a placard that you will print out uh, upon approval for posting in a visible location and we've created a web page to provide additional information about the TOSAs with an online application. Following my presentation, as I said, the guts of this application will be presented by Chrissy Wallentish. So we want to remind businesses of a couple of key points. Although Virginia guidelines allow up to 50% occupancy during phase one, that might not be feasible in certain instances where there's just not enough usable space while adhering to the physical distancing requirements. In terms of furnishing spaces, everything should be temporary in nature and not require a building permit. Rooftops that are already established for outdoor dining do not need to complete the TOSA process. And finally, Cooperation among neighbors is encouraged to arrive at better solutions, particularly for the use of the public right-of-way and the streamlined review. Wei Wang, who is our Transportation Engineering and Operations Bureau Chief, will be able to provide a bit more information on this topic. Thank you. Um, okay, that, I guess that's the cue for me to uh, join in. Hi, this is Wei. Uh, we're going to talk about potential use of parking lane. Just think about all the businesses. Uh, if you have your door open to the sidewalk, you probably have a parking lane, either metered parking or signed parking in front of that, that curb. Uh, in the past, those are precious spaces for your patrons to park. And then uh, when COVID just started, many of you has reached out and to, uh, to us and asked for assistance on pickup service. So we assigned many of these parking spaces to what we call a temporary PUDO zone. PUDO stands for pick up and drop off. So many of you already have the parking taken away and assigned as pickup service. 
Now, uh, when TOSA comes online, uh, if you are looking to expanding or establishing or just you know restart your outdoor seating on the sidewalk, there may be a conflict between where does the pedestrian con uh, go, where is my customer who's queuing on the sidewalk, how do they keep uh, social distancing? Was that uh, there may be a need to re reassign these uh, parking spaces and parking lane for use as the uh, temporary pedestrian bypass. Uh, I have to emphasize though, um, use of the public space, especially the parking lane, can be a little bit complicated. Why? Because think about uh, for pedestrian pass, there is the national ADA uh, law regulate a ADA accessible passing route for pedestrian. And ADA does not just include wheelchair, it also include blind person. And because of that, uh, we, we can use the parking lane for pedestrian bypass for people that can comfortably hop off and on to the curb. But in order for the wheelchair and strollers to navigate that terrain, they will need either uh, ramps for them to get up and down, or they will need to be able to enter from where it is at street level. Uh, Jill has mentioned about a sort of neighbors talk to each other and a consolidated uh, solution block by block may be a preferable uh, option for you all because if you have the entire block redesignating that parking lane for pedestrian bypass, mm -hmm. then there could be a, a chance for the wheelchair and strollers to enter from the intersection instead of having to build a temporary pedestrian uh, ramp. That only solved the wheelchair portion for a blind, a blind person. Uh, there is no easy way to redirect them into the parking lane. It's, the ramps and all those truncated domes on the ramp will lead them onto the sidewalk. So please don't think of, I'm gonna take this entire sidewalk with uh, for you know outdoor seating. You will need to leave a passable uh, way for the blind person to go through. Uh, with all that, uh, I know uh, on the slides there are some more details and there will be more design guidelines coming. Uh, the takeaway point is please talk to your neighbors, make sure that uh, you have a relatively consolidated design along the frontage uh, because the missing tooth type of formation will be very hard to do. Uh, so that's one. Two is the picture that we're showing on the slide show the Jersey barrier actually blocking it out. Uh, we will not uh, be able to do the Jersey barriers because those are pretty difficult to put them uh, in place and uh, also resource supply may not be uh, sufficient. What we will do is we can use uh, rubber wheel stoppers uh, line them longitudinally and use the flexible bollards that you probably have seen uh, places in Arlington, uh, especially on the bike lanes, the flexible vertical bollards. We're going to use those as a way to separate uh, the parking lane from the travel, lane, the travel lane by the vehicle in order to provide a designated space for uses other than parking. That will take the on the curb poodle activity away. As you can see on the picture, there's no way someone can stop and, and do pickup. So uh, if you still have pickup needs and you also want to use the sidewalk for seating, then alternative way of assigning the uh, poodle activity, you know, identify other locations around the corner, things like that need to happen. Uh, a lot of, I mean, you know your business and you know your block very well. So I will say it is time to talk to your neighbors and come up with a design. The design will come in along with the TOSA application. And then we will evaluate, we will help you if we can to any way assist you to come up with a better design. And, uh, and we go from there. 
Okay, and I will take it from there. Thank you, Wei. Good morning, everyone. This is Chrissy Wallentish. I'm with the Department of Community Planning, Housing, and Development, and I'll be going over the application process for these temporary outdoor seating areas, as well as the, the, guideline, the guidelines that we have created. So before I start, I just want to preface with uh, Arlington County is one of the more denser regions within the state of Virginia, and because of that, we aren't going to have as much open space or land where these outdoor seating areas can easily go. So the county is going to need to assess them to ensure that they're designed in ways and placed in locations that don't negatively impact the community, and also while ensuring that we're promoting and protecting the health, health and safety guidelines for the COVID response. So that's the reason for this application process. We have tried to make it as flexible as possible, and we do look forward to seeing restaurants and other businesses slowly opening back up here in Arlington. Okay, so on this slide, you, there's a big screenshot of the TOSA website. So that, that website is up and live. It went live yesterday. So if you haven't already found your way to it, feel free to, uh, to go to our website after the webinar. It's, the website is building.arlingtonva.us slash permit slash TOSA. You can also probably search it in the toolbar. Uh, and the application is linked to on that website, both in a fillable PDF form, which you can then email to tosa at arlingtonva.us once you filled it out. Or you can also print out the PDF form, fill it out manually, scan it, and send it in to us to that same email address. Okay, so very briefly, for the application process, you're going to submit the application online via tosa to arlingtonva.us. If you have any questions, that'll be the same email address or the phone number at the bottom of the screen you can call us to. Um, be sure you read the TOSA guidelines very, very thoroughly. They, I will go over those after this slide, and, and they can, it does, it does look daunting, but a lot of them are pretty uh, common sense, um, and not all of them will apply to your TOSA since they're by location. So the county will then review the request, and if you're approved, we're going to send you an email letting you know, and it's going to be signed by the county manager, and then you're going to get a placard that has your approved seating chart for the TOSA, and it's important that you need to post that either on your business window, if the TOSA is nearby, if it's on the sidewalk, or if your TOSA is a little further away, then you need to put it on the TOSA itself, just to show everyone, both for enforcement reasons and for safety reasons for pedestrians, just so we can ensure that you are abiding by all the regulations we set forth for these TOSAs. Next slide, please. Okay, so these are the general requirements. I know it, it looks like a lot, but again, a lot of them have we've already gone over. There are a few that fall in line with the ABC requirements. Um, so I'm, I've, I've underlined the, the basic gist of each bullet here, but I'm gonna go through them quickly. The first two are very important. Um, the first one is that just because we have, if you fill out a TOSA application and you have a, um, and you and you have a permitted TOSA, you still need to abide by all of the other state, uh, federal, state, and local laws and regulations, and that's especially particular to the um, the, the COVID regulations. So what what Candace spoke to for the the health and safety requirements, uh, everything ACD, uh, ACPD will speak to. Um, you need to still ensure that you're abiding by all the the governor's executive orders and so forth for for restaurants and for your use. Um, and then the second bullet is just to remind everyone, because I think we've already started to see this happening a little bit, is you just keep in mind that these, all of this is temporary. This process is temporary. These choices will be temporary. And so you please don't go out into the small space you have in front of your restaurant and construct a, a seating area. Please don't do a deck or anything, um, because we, these are just meant to be very temporary. We're thinking tables and chairs just to get you all reopened in phase one. Um, and anything that you think would require a building permit probably does so we are trying to minimize the amount of construction uh, they really should be constructed in a way where they can be taken down at the end of the day so please keep that in mind okay and for number three please remember our TOSAs are only pitted, permitted for existing restaurants or food and beverage services service establishments um, with approved certificates of occupancy um, so this isn't a new process for any anyone who would um, like to have a restaurant you have to have an approved CO already. Okay, for number four, we've already spoke to this, but of course the tables and chairs do need to be at least six feet apart. And in your seating diagram that you submit with your application, you'll need to show that they are spaced to that those dimensions. We do require um, you to provide dimensions of the TOSA and the distances in between the seats. And also for this one, this is for this goes in line with the ABC regulations, but you cannot have parties of more than 10 people. For number five, we already spoke to this one as well, but you, your, your occupancy has been set by ABC and, and it cannot surpass 50% of the lowest occupancy load that is on your approved CO. For number six, 
as we get you all opened up again with only outdoor seating allowed right now, we are not allowing any live entertainment in these chosas. Um, we'll see how, how this goes, as, um, however long the process goes. But for right now, we really just want to get you all back up and running. So no live entertainment, games, activities, TVs, or piped in music right now. Okay, and the next one's really important too. You need to make sure that all TOSA patrons have access to restrooms, your inside restrooms. So this is, this, this gets tricky if you have a carryout restaurant that doesn't have, act, that where restaurant patrons don't have access to bathrooms because that's a code requirement and you need to ensure that they do have access. If you're gonna have seating, even in a TOSA, that they have access to a restroom. Please keep that in mind. Then the last two are, in, again, in line with the ABC requirements. If you are going to be selling alcohol within the TOSA, it needs to be located within 100 feet of your business, and we are limiting the hours from 9 a.m. until 11 p.m. If this, and that's only if your your hours of operation are are extended beyond that. If they're within that, then that's fine. You can operate within your normal hours. Next slide, please. Okay, these guidelines speak to TOSAs on public sidewalks. You may extend into the public sidewalk uh, with the TOSA approved TOSA request. Um, uh, you need to keep make sure that everything's six feet apart of course um, you need they need to for number two they need to be on paved surfaces and again they can't block anything so that should be a little you know common sense if, if you don't think a chair should really fit in a location um, it probably shouldn't be there anyway so we, we don't want to see that and you're gonna have to show that on your diagram you submit with the application um, same thing for the next one really make sure it fits within the streetscape so don't put a chair in a in a parking spot where we haven't approved a a, a, a pedestrian walkway within that parking spot Things like that. Um, you need to keep a five foot clear path, and that is for delivery and curbside pickup operations. So that would be the distance, the path between your door and the curb. You need to keep like a vertical clear path so people can get into and out of the restaurant easily. So you can't put a chair right in front of your front door. And then you need, um, let's see, any sort of shade structures. So umbrellas, canopies, or awnings. They can't hang over the TOSA. So we don't want anyone getting poked in the eye from an umbrella, um, umbrella sphere or anything. Um, so make sure they, they stay within the, the, the confines of the TOSA. And then a minimum six foot wide ADA accessible pedestrian pathway should be maintained for public passage. So if it is on the sidewalk and you do not have one of those passageways in the street as way spoke to, then you do need to ensure you're retaining six feet so pedestrians can walk by on the sidewalk. Next slide, please. Okay, this slide more so speaks to the circulation patterns that Wei was describing with the, the coordinated TOSAs. If we do analyze certain areas where we think it would, both the restaurants and the, the pedestrians would benefit from a coordinated TOSA area, then we might decide to block off some, some curbside spaces for um, for pedestrian circulation, and so these guidelines speak to if that is um, if that is the layout of your TOSA on your block there. So we're going to have to look at those on a, on a block by block basis to determine whether um, that's feasible um, on on your in your area. And so for those, you would need to um, yeah, let's see, you can use them. Circulation zone must be protected. So Wade talked about the barriers, and we would need to coordinate all this to ensure that what's proposed is, is okay with the county. Um, and those are the rest of those are straightforward. So you can go on to the next slide. Okay, so we are allowing POSAs in public spaces. So these would be any sort of public plazas or areas of public access easements. Um, maybe if, in some cases, the county would own this property. Um, you do need to make sure that, again, the six, six feet apart at all times, just, just that's the assumption moving forward for likely the rest of this year. Um, and then also for this, if you do put these here, you, remember, you need, still need to go through the TOSA process. We do still need to review the application. We're just letting you know within these guidelines that you're allowed to put them there. Uh, we still need to review it, though. So if you do do it in a public space, just ensure that you're not spreading out. You don't want to sprawl out um, throughout the entire public area because we do want to keep that space open for other people trying to use that public space. So we try to keep it as confined as possible within the, the six feet rule. Um, and then for bullet number three, also maybe you can't move anything if it's in a public space. So if there's any uh, furnishings or design features within a park or a, a plaza or something, those can't be moved. You'll have to work around those for your TOSA. Um, and then you know, everything needs to be placed on a paved surface and not block any entrances or any of those features. And again, the minimum six foot sidewalk. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so and last for Chosa is located on private property. You can put a Chosa on private property. If say, let's say your restaurant is within um, a larger building and the, um, the building owner has some outdoor space where uh, your Chosa would, would be okay going. Um, it, it meets all the requirements within the application and the design guidelines. Um, and you're more than welcome to use that space. Again, you still need to go through the Chosa process and, and apply. And we need, we need to look and make sure. But the main thing with that is you also need the owner's permission. So don't just go put out chairs if it's not your property, because um, we need to we need to look at that and ensure that they've allowed you to to utilize that space. So we envision these again in in private properties areas. So these could be also plazas or courtyards, but they're owned by by the building owner or a different property owner, um, or also in parking lots. So if, if you do have access to a parking lot, if one is adjacent to your building. Um, if it is or is not owned by you, if you're the property owner, you can utilize the space. You would ideally want the, those choices to be located in corners so they don't conflict with pedestrian and vehicular traffic. Um, and you would just, if you are selling alcohol, it would need to be within 100 feet of the establishment. So you still need to abide by those rules. And again, just not, not blocking any furnishings. So that is really it. I know, I know that's, that's really it. That's a lot of information. All of this is on the website. All of this is in an application. Um, this is just a general overview. And again, not all of these will apply to you. It really depends on where your TOSA is located. So to summarize the application process, the website is live. The application is on the website. The process and guidelines are posted. And we look forward to reviewing your applications. So Arlington Restaurants can open back up soon. Thank you so much, Chrissy. That's great information, very useful. And um, if folks have questions, is this the same thing? They can go right up to the website? Yes. Okay, yep. great. And if they, have, if, if they find that their question is not answered on our website, feel free to give us a call on the, the, both our, our, our phone number and that email, toast the email are, are just fine. Oh, wonderful. Thank you all so much for that great information. Um, next. Went. Sorry, I, I muted myself by mistake. Um, now we're going to move on to hear from Captain Chris Cox. He's with the fire department and he's going to talk about some of the things that you have to take in consideration as you move into phase one. Good morning, everyone. Chris Cox, the assistant fire marshal of the fire prevention office. Um, I just want to touch base with you. Uh, so the, if you have an original certificate of occupancy, uh, the number that you received was done for life safety within your establishment. The governor's order uh, 61 for 50% outdoor capacity uh, of your original certificate of occupancy, or if you're in the process of application for your TOSA, is focused more on personal protection. Uh, as is said before, the Virginia Department of Health is enforcing that, where in the past we have enforced the occupancy, but with it being below the fire code, we do not have the ability to enforce that. Uh, you will see us out, and uh, especially along Clarendon and Wilson and Clarendon Boulevard, but we're gonna be more of an advisory role and education uh, for anything that you may have. So you still will see us out there, but hindsight is that the um, Virginia Department of Public Health has the ability to enforce the 50% capacity. And as Tara said, let's all do our part and our due diligence and keep our capacity at 50% and not over so we can move from phase one to phase two and then get back to normalcy. That's what everybody wants. So as you're a business owner, Let's make sure that we can do that and keep it at 50% capacity. Um, with that, I think you need to have a dedicated person uh, to keep that 50% number, whether you already know it because you have an original CO, or if you're going to get go through the process of the TOSA certificate, they will give you a number. Have one person that is dedicated for that number for whatever it may be. Uh, one tip I can give you, uh, if you go to Dick's Sporting Goods, they have a count for pitching. You can keep one in and out, however you want to do it, cell phones. Today, everybody's got a cell phone, but use your cell phone. However, keep that number of who's in and who's going out uh, so you can regulate your number correctly. And as always, with it, the outside dining, inside the establishments is the occupancy number. Have whatever your number is posted outside near the dining area, your 50% outdoor capacity number near the dining area. And that's not only for the public health official or the fire marshal to know what your number, it's also for your staff. So if somebody comes in and they're, oh, what was my, they can look and find out and they know exactly what that number is. 
Um, maintain your egress. So just like inside, outside, if something happens, we need to make sure that you have a safe travel of at least 36 inches to a safe egress area where everybody can get out. If you have 50 more, if your number happens to be 70, you have to have two areas of safe egress, clear path, no tables in the middle, so everybody can move out accordingly, just like you do inside. So nothing's changed with that. Um, as far as permit inspections, uh, some of you businesses know that we do annual permit inspections. Uh, we start December, January, and February. If we have not gotten finished with your permit inspection, uh, the fire marshals in the last month have been, at, or last two weeks actually, have been asked to go out and start with uh, your reinspections to make sure you're up to date. If you have not heard, if your assembly permit that you have has expired from last year, obviously you can still open. The fire marshals are going to get with you and find out a, a good time to come by and knock out those reinspections, and uh, so we can keep moving forward. Um, Kirk, commercial type one hoods fire suppression systems. I can't stress this enough. Every six months, they need to be tested to make sure they're working properly. The last time we out, were out there may have, been may have been December and we're six months past, past that now or close to it and it could be expired. So make sure that you have that inspected and it needs to be witnessed by us once out of the year every six months every year it needs to be done twice one of those year one of those times during a year needs to be witnessed by us um i have it up on the website i thought i had a slide here but i don't see it um write this number down if you need to have your your hood system done you can call and have it witnessed by us which is the number is 703-228-4647 and that is to call to schedule a um a hood system test uh, I was listening in this one, and I had added a little ad lib here. The temporary uh, bullets that are going to go in place. Curbside parking is now going to be open for pedestrian traffic. Uh, when you put in your TOSA application, we're not quite sure who's going to get it, these temporary curbs or uh, pedestrian traffic areas. But as you drive through Arlington, refrain from any distracted driving, because it sounds to me like you could have parking on one side in the next second, you could have temporary bullards where people are using that to, to uh, move up and down the streets of Arlington. Uh, it's it's gonna put the people closer to the lane of travel because now you don't have curbside parking to protect them from the curbside. Please, please, please pay attention as you're driving through the roads of Arlington in the next however long it takes us to get back to normalcy. But as always, you should pay attention, but especially now as we're putting patrons and people, pedestrians out near the lane of travel. Um, any questions that you have that I did not cover or you want to talk to me offline, uh, we have an email. It's fireprevention at arlingtonva.us. You can send an email there and it will be directed to uh, myself. Or if you want to call with any other questions, 703-228-4644. Uh, Leave a message and someone checks it daily and that message will get to me and I will respond back. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Captain. This was excellent information, and we'll be sure to get the phone numbers and the information out after this um, presentation. So thank you. Next, we're going to move to here for, to Barbara Storm, who is the special agent in charge at the Virginia Alcohol and Beverage Authority. Barbara, we're really grateful to have you um, on the webinar today. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I wanted to start by saying if you have an existing outside dining area that was previously approved by ABC prior to the public health emergency, you do not need to notify us before you reopen that area to customers. If you have a restaurant that does not have an ABC license and you want to create a new outside dining area, you do not need to contact Virginia ABC. And if you have an ABC license and you want to create a new outside dining area, or you have an existing outside dining area that you wish to expand, then you would need to contact Virginia ABC in order to um, embark upon the expedited approval process. 
once you receive approval from um, Arlington County to operate the temporary outdoor seating area, then notify your special agent. You would provide a copy of that approval with a diagram of your space and authorization, written permission from the owner of the property, giving you exclusive control over that area. And once those items are received by the special agent, then you may begin using that space for outside dining. In this area, you must be able to provide table seating um, that will be used exclusively for dining and or beverage consumption. And that includes uh, offering of uh, meals with entrees. The outside dining area must be clearly defined. Each licensee must have their own exclusive outside dining area. This outside dining area is gonna be an extension of your permanent retail licensed location. So there can be no sharing or commingling of um, outside dining areas by any ABC licensed establishments. And um, as uh, was previously mentioned, there can be no entertainment in the temporarily approved areas. And uh, for ABC purposes, anything after sunset, the area should be well lit, the lighting should be sufficient so that the proprietors can determine the patron's age and sobriety, as well as to facilitate the consumption of food and alcoholic beverages. Um, the agent assigned to Arlington is not available this week, so I'm going to um, give you the office phone number um, if you have additional questions outside the parameters of this webinar. Please call that number and we will assign an agent to you to help you through the process. And that number is 703-313-4433. Okay, thank you so much, Barbara. We will also share that phone number. It's actually in the chat. And if anyone has any questions, feel free um, to reach out. Next, I'm going to move on to Jim Mastoris, who's going to be talking about business support and resources. He's with the Arlington Restaurant Initiative. Thanks, Jim. Good morning, thank you, Tara. Uh, so we want to talk about um, what has been happening behind the scenes with a lot of the businesses and uh, the orders that uh, have been coming out um, sporadically here um, for the past two months. Uh, the business outreach unit, uh, we've been focused on providing guidance for the businesses, uh, providing guidance for the officers, and then how to navigate um, the governor's orders as, they, as they've come out. Uh, recently, we put together with, in conjunction with uh, BizLaunch a, uh, another resource guide that we hope is going to be very useful for the businesses and restaurants as they move into phase one and start to uh, safely open. Uh, we believe that um, we heard a lot of good feedback from uh, the restaurant owners, um, community planning and housing development, as well as the county board and county manager's office about uh, how much um, insight was provided by the business owners uh, with the, the uh, TOSA process. So we're, we're happy that we have these relationships and these connections. Uh, the police will be uh, handling the things that we normally do, which is um, inequality of life issues, um, alcohol-related offenses, uh, things like that in response to um, phase one opening. The things that we um, hope to manage and mitigate with the restaurant owners and managers specifically is having a plan in case lines form, uh, how they're going to manage um, reservations. We would ask them to take names and phone numbers and consider time limits on tables. Uh, so um, in relation to order 63, um, which requires the face mask, we will not be enforcing that. That's going to be a public health um, responsibility. And then we're going to continue the way we always have, which is um, training, guidance, and education. Those are the things that we want to stress um, in helping businesses comply with uh, the restrictions and the orders as, as they move forward. Uh, 
Okay, and I also want to say, Jim, along with that, the resource guide, folks should be receiving that uh, today. It's gone out. It was the labor of love. I have it right here. Um, I don't know if you could see it, uh, but this information has hyperlinks. It has all the information that we kind of went over today. This webinar itself is taped. So you'll have the guide, you'll have the webinar. We'll make sure to include all the phone numbers and additional uh, websites. And so with that, we wanna jump into q and I know we're over the hour, but we wanna at least for the next 15 minutes, if, if everyone is agreeable, to try to get to as many questions that you may have. So I'm going to turn over the podium to my friend, Alex, who's been filtering a lot of these questions. And so Alex, what's out there? So we've gotten a lot of questions coming in and the beauty of technology is that we can actually answer these. Um, even if we're not able to get to them today, we can follow back up with you. But um, in general, um, you know, there was a lot of public health questions. Um, so Candace, this would be for you, this first one. Um, and someone is that had asked um, uh, Mr. Thomas, are we still permitted to take employees temps when they come to work and send home if their the temp their temperature is too high? Um, yes. So if an employee um, is suspected or diagnosed with COVID, um, the employee should um, and their symptoms would be fever, cough, shortness of breath, um, and if they um, then they need to go home, stay home, or go home. Um, and if it is the employer's responsibility to, ha to either have the employees doing self checks um, where they tell them what the temperature is or checking when they do arrive. And if they do arrive and they have a temperature, send them home immediately, isolate the area um, for at least 24 hours. If you can't isolate the area for at least 24 hours, then you'd wanna clean and dis um, wait as long as possible um, before going in that area. Um, disinfect, clean and disinfect the area and use one of those EPA approved products. Um, bleach, a simple bleach solution can be used as a disinfectant. It is considered an EPA approved product. Um, and the concentrations and manufacturer specifications are all online and on the CDC guidance. So yes, um, if they do take a person's temperature and it comes back that they are 100.4 or higher, they should be sent home. Okay, thank you. And while I have you, Candace, um, um, Pat was asking about um, elevator usage. Is there a specific signage that needs to be displayed on elevators? So you want, there what aren't specific signs for elevators, but you want to social distance as much as possible. Here at the health department, we are only allowing two people per elevator. Um, that is our own internal rule. Um, so he can, he can, take that same guidance and, and just, you know, recommend only two people per elevator, but you still want to make sure that you can social distance at least six feet. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, and so I'm going to kind of move into, well, this is actually um, Ramsey um, Azar, and we're going to move into um, the TOSA. Um, and Zach Wall had a question. Um, and this has actually been a question of mine as well, is regarding fitness studios and parks. So fitness studios, and Candace, correct me if I'm wrong, they're not allowed to be open for indoor fitness activities, correct? Correct. Okay, so that, that forces them to go into utilize parks. So can, and, and, and Jill and, and Chrissy, this may be a question for you, what is the permitting process for a fitness studio that wants to utilize a park? And it is will the county be helping to provide space at parks or parking lots for outdoor fitness? Hey, Alex, this is Jill Hunger. Um, at uh -huh. this point, I, I am not certain if there's an actual application process uh, for the use of, of um, of our parks. What we can do is coordinate with our colleagues over in the Department of Parks and Recreation and provide an answer. Okay, 
Thank you. And we'll, and, and Zach, I'll get back to you um, on this so you um, we can get a further guidance on that from you. But thank you. Chrissy, did you want to add anything? Just a note that the TOSA application right now is just for food and beverage establishments. So we are just looking at that right now since they require the, the seating. So they need the outdoor seating area. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the, uh, this, this got a little, um, this is actually for uh, regarding TOSA. And I think Jill, Chrissy, um, and even ABC may get involved, um, be able to provide some guidance. So Stephen Smith, and I think this is Stephen from CPRO. Um, mentioned that the county board resolutions states that there shall be no sharing or commingling of TOSAs by any licensee. How do neighboring restaurants with limited parking lot or street space work through this? And I guess the follow-up question, because it seemed a little unclear with the ABC regulations when I heard it, can a bid district or you know CPRO or you know a partnership group file apply for a, a joint TOSA application for on behalf of their neighboring you know restaurants sure i can i can take this so for the the commingling per abc regulations you do have to each separate TOSA for each establishment does have to have a separate defined barrier so the, and we are keeping the regulations for the TOSAs for the county in line with that so they do need to be separately defined but they can be close by one another. So if we're thinking of a strip where restaurants that are all in one street on the same side of the street have outdoor seating areas and they're all in alignment with each other, that's okay. They just need to be individually defined. So they need to have a, a barrier, expansions or some sort of a rope or fence to delineate each individual TOSA. And then the second part of sorry, can you repeat? Oh, the and the group applications. And I think the question was is is could a bid district or CPRO or you know partner neighborhood group you know apply for a joint Atlatosa application on behalf of their restaurant businesses located there with? I, I can speak to that. Uh, the answer to that question is no, because uh, the reason that we have clearly defined areas for each outdoor dining area is that we're we're trying to accommodate our businesses while still keeping in mind that each licensee is responsible for monitoring the sobriety of their patrons, uh, being responsible for the sale and service of alcohol to underage persons, and that that outdoor dining area is an extension of the business that they operate that is brick and mortar. Uh, so to have that, there's no license currently uh, uh, under Title 4.1 of the Code of Virginia that permits a uh, uh, food court concept in this environment. We do have some food courts in our malls, but those malls aren't open now. And, and we've, we've tried to make accommodations to expand outdoor dining areas so our businesses can open. And um, this standard was put into place after conversations with the governor's office, the State Department of Health, the Attorney General's office. Uh, and so this is a standard that is going to be put in place around the state. Okay, hey, Alex, this is Jill, if I can just yeah. clarify, um, per Barbara and, and what she was saying with Virginia ABC, is that yes, each individual restaurant must have its own TOSA. However, okay. if there is an idea with, if there is an instance where there might be multiple restaurants along the same block, we are encouraging them to work with each other to have the best layout to accommodate the pedestrian circulation in that area. In that instance, that's where we are encouraging the restaurants to work together or our bids, our partnerships, or other groups to sort of help each other understand how that whole block space is, is working, um, allow us to work with that group all together. Um, collaboratively and but each individual uh, restaurant will have its own TOSA so hopefully that clarifies that hey, Alex, thank you for that, 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 that did. Jim yeah go ahead and so uh, I've heard some several of the other owners uh, as the webinar was going on and there's a couple questions well first of all we need to make it clear I don't know if it, if, if, if it wasn't that this is only applying to outdoor seating 
So um, the 50% capacity uh, applies to outdoor seating, not indoor. Um, I just want to make that clear. And then, and then the other piece of this is, and, and um, I think this would be good for Chrissy and uh, perhaps um, Barbara Storm to weigh in, is I uh, got another question about uh, rooftops and uh, existing rooftops and patios that have already um, gone through the process and have existing use permits outside of TOSA and what the restrictions would be on them because uh, of the guidance put out not only from the order, but um, through the guidance put out through ABC, uh, didn't address existing. Okay, thank you. And that's why we're all bringing everybody together, it's just so we're all on the same page. So, that, and, and Candace, this is gonna be for you, um, but I feel free, anybody else that wants to jump in. We had a question um, early on in the program, and it was about, um, um, so restaurants as they are today right, and in phase one are not able to offer indoor seating, correct? Correct. So even if they follow all the other guidelines, they cannot have indoor seating at all and, and offer indoor seating for patrons. Correct. Phase one does not include indoor seating and that also goes for the food court in the mall. They are not allowed to have indoor seating in the food court area as well. Okay, but they could have a takeout station, you know, designated for people to come in, grab food and leave, correct? Yes, they can have a takeout station. People should be social distancing in the takeout station and they should not have more than 10 patrons in the facility waiting for takeout. Okay, yeah, I think that was a question, Andrew. Starting to that, um, answered that. Did anybody else want to jump in or? Yes, this is uh, Barbara with ABC. If they have an ABC license and they have a takeout station, that is for picking up your order and leaving the the uh, proprietor is not permitted to offer their customers alcoholic beverages for consumption while they wait for their takeout order i wanted to make sure everybody okay. understood that thank you barbara okay so there was a lot of questions and way this is going to be for you and chrissy um about the barriers so the first question was that um, stephen asked was Say a restaurant applies for a TOSA and wants to leverage the on-street parking in front of their facility because they don't have enough sidewalk space. Is and the county puts in the ballers. Is the yeah. business required to pay for baller in bollard installation or those barriers to protect um, to provide the division? The bollards, the rubber uh, wheel stoppers that we use to separate the travel lane from the parking lane those will be provided uh, by the county and the cost is uh, on the county. Okay, thank you, Wei. Now, the other question um, was around the barriers for um, establishments for their TOSA. Um, in, in normal, you know, usually you have to have some sort of barrier to in any outdoor seating um, for ABC. Um, our, I assume with the TOSA, application that restaurants um, are required to provide barriers to enclose them is that correct um, yes this is for the areas must be clearly defined we'll leave it up to the county to dictate what that would look like um, but they must be clearly okay. defined it could be rope stanchions snow fencing something got you the little flexi and fence that you get and just to follow up on that, so for the TOSA application, we do ask that as one of the questions. So we do ask if you will be selling alcohol. If you answer yes to that, then you need to describe the barrier that you'll have in place. But we are, we aren't, we aren't providing any other guidelines or requirements as to what the barriers will look like. We let that up to ABC. So whatever they allow, we're, we're okay with. They just have to be temporary. Okay. So they that that was the other question that I was going to ask. So they they have to remove the the. The TOSA has to be removed, especially if it's in a public space, after daily service or end of day. It can't be left outdoors overnight, you know. Am I, am I understanding that correctly? That's what we're envisioning. Um, I think that's probably how it would look like if, if um, you know, I think we kind of have to see how how this all goes in, in phase one um, when, when restaurants start 
for opening, but for now they should be as removable to where every all the furnishings can be replaced inside at, after a day. Gotcha. So this is also a TOSA question. Um, so, you know, way you mentioned that, you know, potentially parking lanes could be closed. Um, could potentially, you know, one in one, I think one example of this, and someone submitted this earlier, there's the business on Restaurant Row and 23rd Street in Crystal City. They've asked, could a street be closed to provide expansion for a TOSA application or group? Uh, no, we're not considering closed streets. And the reason being, the streets are also used for uh, emergency uh, and public access. Uh, it'll be, I will say, it'll be very difficult to identify any street that can be safely closed. So the answer is Thank no. You, okay. And Chrissy, this is a question for you. Did um, an applicant or someone reached out and said, asked if there was a requirement, you know, I've got a private space that could be used for TOSA and I've got a public space that could be used for TOSA. Do I need to apply for them separately or you apply for them all as one? How does that, how do you envision that working? Huh. Um, <laughs> I'd like to see what what, uh, what what restaurant that is. Um, I think we'd probably need them together. You can probably put them on the same application. You just need to to very well describe your situation there. So you would need two seating charts for each TOSA area. Um, but the capacity would still be limited, you know, to overall. So you can't you can't split your capacity between it. It would be you'd still be limited to what your capacity is set by your CO. So it's likely that you could do it. You can put them on the same application. Just explain it very well to us. Um, and again, your capacity is limited by your your CO. Gotcha. Alex, I oh, jumped in. No, I know no, we're gonna go we're way overextended. <laughs> no, 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 no. There is one question that a lot of people are asking that Jim had kind of set up, but we didn't answer the question. So about the patios and rooftops that aren't part of TOSA and how that's going to be regulated. So if our friends from planning or, you know, Jill or Way could weigh in on on that, because that we're getting a lot of questions on that. So this is for so for existing rooftops. You can if you have outdoor dining now and you offer that and you can get tables and chairs, then it's okay. You can utilize the rooftop. You don't need to go through the the, the TOSA process if you have it. What we don't want people doing is trying to create new rooftops um, because if you come in, if you try to apply for a TOSA application and trying to create a new deck or rooftop deck, uh, mm -hmm. we're not going to allow that. So we again, we don't want anyone to have to go through the building permit process to to create a TOSA. Um, so if you have a, a, a rooftop and you are already using it, it has a CO, you're already using it for outdoor dining, you already have an ABC license for it, that space, and, and you can utilize it. Okay, thank you. And Alex, I think we should, we still have a great quorum of people. So let's continue with maybe five more minutes of questions, and then we'll, we'll start to wrap up. If that's okay for all of our panelists. So if I could just add to Chrissy's comment. Thank you. The uh, patio hat or the uh, um, rooftop has an ABC license. Um, they should already be operating it as a dining room. There should already be table seating uh, up there. There should not be, and, and under this COVID environment, it should not be just an open bar with standing room only environment on those rooftops. I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. And, and Special Agent Storm, could you also clarify uh, for the viewers and everyone's asking um, how the hours will be regulated as well, please? Well, under this public health emergency, the sale and consumption of alcohol uh, uh, in the expedited uh, temporary outdoor dining areas is uh, between 6 a.m. and 11 p.m. The county has further uh, restricted that to uh, 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. Um, uh, so those will be the uh, now as far as um, I, I don't know that or I'm not did that answer your question? Well, the guidance under the ABC uh, regulated that was for the temporary outdoor seating areas, and I, and the question is 
about um, areas such as rooftops and patios that already have use permits and fall outside of the temporary outdoor dining areas. Would those be allowed, um, those owners want to know if they're allowed to serve until um, the, the regular, which is 2 a.m.? I, um, pardon me enough, have not been asked that question before. Our, our guidance um, uh, suggests that any, pre, any outdoor dining areas that were previously approved by ABC uh, may remain in effect and they are not subject to the expedited process and those are conditions. But uh, I will certainly get confirmation for that so that we all are on the same page and everybody around the state is being treated fairly. And I can send that response. Um, I don't know, you want me to send it to you, Chrissy? Or Jim, do you want me to send it to you? Yeah, I think send it to, if you wouldn't mind sending it to Jim, um, Barbara, you know, we work with them quite a bit and we can push that out to all the, the people that attended the program or registered for the program. My, in, my instincts tell me no because of the unique environment of the COVID crisis, but I want to be sure that my response is accurate. So um, I will run that through our legal department to make sure that I give everyone the same uh, response. Perfect. Thank you, Barbara. I have one more comment. And, this is Candace. I just want to say that roll up garage doors or uh, facilities that have open walls or windows that open up, those are not considered outdoor dining areas either. So um, those areas must so remain. Outdoor open. dining literally means no roof over your head in a sense. Correct. Is that how you're defining it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It, it, it's the same, uh, would have the same response to that statement. We okay. Name it. Um, we had a lot of questions of just about how to figure capacity, and so I thought this was this example that um, Los Tios um, presented was a very just simple way to help people um, kind of figure that out. Um, it's a math question, so and Candace, this may be for you, but also I think Chrissy, this will probably go to you as well. So our restaurant has an indoor capacity of 148 plus outdoor capacity of 30. If we apply for TOSA, what would be the 50% capacity? Is it the 15 or how would you figure that out? How would you figure that? So the 50% capacity is based off the lowest capacity. So if they have 30 outdoor seats, they would allow they would be allowed to have 15 seats. That's how we interpret the, the regulation. Right, okay. Chrissy, did you wanna add anything to that? I concur with Candace's statement. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, do, 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 do. Um, forgive me. Um, well, this is an important question. So Chrissy, um, th there's been kind of a lot of questions around the timeline for the approval process. Can you speak to that, you and Jill, potentially? Sure, so we, we um, we haven't quite set a timeline because we don't want to set expectations and, 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 not, and not be able to meet them. So this is all, again, very temporary. This is a new process we're trying to roll out. There are sure to be bumps. Um, we don't want to set a timeline again because um, we aren't sure what that's going to look like. We think different types of TOSAs, depending on where they're located, are going to require a, a longer county review. And those might require, um, those would be ones for ones in public open spaces where we just, or that need a DES a right of way permit. So maybe those that are coordinated in the, in the public right of way. Um, so it really just depends on, um, you know, where it is and, and case by case basis. So that's why the TOSA application process in itself is important. So we can look at these uh, on a case by case basis. Um, so I can't give anyone a, a direct time frame. Um, I think as Jill had a slide in there that, you know, if you, if you get an application in and you're on private property, you can go ahead to operate prior to approval and we're okay with that. Um, but if, if we come back with any changes that you need to make to your TOSA, then you, you need to, you need to do that. Um, so, uh, but again, it's really just the public spaces and ones that might be in the public right away that might require a longer approval time. Um, but nothing, again, we're trying to, we will try to get to them as quick as possible and try to pull staff resources um, to make it a, an expedited review. Gotcha. And is there a limit to the number of TOSAs being issued? Are you? Nope. 
you just need to meet the requirements. So if you have the space for it and we're okay with where you're, where you're proposing it, you're, you're okay. You just have to, you have to have an existing CO. Okay. And there was just, a, just, to, just to clarify, so, and, and if I speak incorrectly, please, um, you know, phase one begins at midnight this evening, correct? Are we still on pace to go in that direction, group? I would have to check the TOSA email to see if we have any applications. <laughs> so no, right now we haven't approved any because we are rolling this out. Um, we, we do have to get to them as soon as possible. Um, we just ask everyone bear with us as we as we get to this process. Um, you know, we, we this, again, this is all new. So we are gonna review them as, as fast as possible. If you're on private property, um, you can go ahead and open if you have already submitted your TOSA application. Um, otherwise, please bear with us and we're gonna try to get you approved as soon as possible. Okay. And then, Jim, you can answer this as well, too, but phase one, we'll start to enter phase one tonight at midnight, correct? That's right. We go into effect tonight, and uh, I think most people will be taking advantage tomorrow uh, and into the weekend. So we're going to have a, uh, a presence to help uh, the owners uh, in the capacity that we normally do uh, with the police department. So we'll have officers out, myself and the unit, um, Sergeant Riccio will be out as well to support the business owners in, in any way we can. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I think that. Yeah, I think that's um, a thank you for handling the questions. Uh, I just want to make sure that everybody realizes that we're not going away and this is a process if um, uh, just know that if you have additional questions, and I have on the webinar a uh, way for you to contact us. Um, I all before we end, I am going to do a same shameless plug. We have a webinar coming up tomorrow on communicating the new normal, and this is how you message, how you talk to your patrons, to your clients, to your customers. It's not necessarily the policies and the regulations, but it's the communication of uh, making sure that everyone stays safe. So the link Onward Arlington is how you register down below. And so we hope that you'll be able to join us for that. I'm also going to share contact information between the business outreach team, which is ARI, and biz launch. So if we don't necessarily know the answers to the questions, we will get those answers for you. We will try to work diligently. Um, just know that we're all in this together and our goal is to make sure that you open up safely and that everyone stays healthy and well. And so in that, we I always would do webinars and workshops and things and say, we don't go away. Uh, literally today is my 19th anniversary with Arlington County. I will be here. Alex will be here, the <laughs> team from <laughs> planning, ABC. And so if you have any questions uh, remaining, feel free or as you go about. We really want to make sure that this is a seamless pro a process for everyone. We thank you for your time today. Uh, know that um, this information is recorded. We'll share it. Uh, and that we will also have all of the documentations and links and phone numbers and contact information will be sent to you later today. Thank you all so very much. Be healthy, be well. I thank our panelists. I thank the county for allowing us to disseminate this information and we'll see you very soon. Have a wonderful day, everyone, and be safe. Take care. Take care.